I'm Peggy Pico. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, California lawmakers have approved the state's massive budget plan. A surprising number of people are hungry in San Diego, and that number is on the rise. How a new study sheds a spotlight on our county's hungry children. And... Raise your hands! Raise your voice! Nuns on a bus make a stop in San Diego on a mission for comprehensive immigration reform. Plus, books are landing on shelves as San Diego's new central library gets ready to open, but they're also becoming attached to the walls. A sneak peek at the library's new art installation. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Erwin Jacobs and by Good evening. Thanks for joining us. The state legislature passed California's massive $97 billion spending plan today ahead of time. Lawmakers had until midnight on Saturday to send Governor Brown a balanced budget that will take effect July 1st. But the politicians acted swiftly after top Democrats reached a deal with the governor. Both houses approved the budget on party line votes. Overall, the budget includes more money for schools, health care, and other services. Some of the highlights, $55 billion will go to K-12 schools and community college while altering the education funding formula. The budget expands the state's Medicaid program under the Affordable Care Act. It restores $63 million to the state court system, and it maintains a billion-dollar reserve. Republicans spoke out against the plan, saying it contains gimmicks. The budget now goes to the governor for approval. A new study reveals 15 percent of the 3 million people living in San Diego County are at risk of going hungry. KPBS reporter Susan Murphy shows us why so many people who struggle to pay for food are not eligible for federal assistance. Nearly 460,000 people in San Diego County don't know where their next meal is coming from. The number of people at risk of hunger in the county has increased by nearly 20,000 people over the last four years. Feeding America's Map the Meal Gap study analyzes household incomes and people's access to food. It also shines a spotlight on hungry children. In San Diego County, nearly 23 percent of children are food insecure, but many are not eligible for federal nutrition programs like free or reduced price school lunches. Instead, they rely on emergency food assistance. The percent of San Diego County's food insecure population falls slightly below the national and state levels but Imperial County to our east has one of the highest rates of hunger in the country at 28 percent. Susan Murphy, KPBS News. Nuclear Regulatory Commission staff want to reject a ruling that contributed to the decision to shut down the San Onofre nuclear power plant permanently. KPBS North County Bureau Chief Allison St. John is monitoring this development. And Allison, what is the ruling the NRC may overturn and, and could it change Edison's decision to shut down the plant permanently? Well, no, Peggy. Even if the NRC voids this ruling, it won't change Edison's decision to pull the plug on the plant. However, it is significant, and here's why. One of the reasons Southern California Edison decided to shut the plant down was because it looked like there'd be long delays before they got permitted to restart one of the reactors. Delays were assured when the Atomic Safety Licensing Board ruled in favor of a Friends of the Earth petition that there should be public hearings before the NRC approved Edison's plans to restart the plant. That could have taken months and exposed the company to a lot of public scrutiny. So now, after the important decision to shut the plant down is already made, the NRC staff is preparing to request that the Atomic Safety Licensing Board ruling is voided. In other words, no public meeting would have been necessary. And Friends of the Earth is naturally angry about this, and they say it's a sign that federal regulators and the nuclear industry are working hand in glove and that the NRC is still protecting Edison from any accusations of wrongdoing. So if the NRC ends up voiding the ruling, would it change anything? Well, yes, it could affect communities in other states like Ohio that are trying to get the nuclear industry to be more transparent. 
All right, KPBS North County Bureau Chief Allison St. John, thanks for the update. Anti-nuclear activists are celebrating the San Onofre plant shutdown, but now there's a new documentary that argues we should mourn the death of the nuclear power plants. Pandora's Promise profiles a group of leading environmentalists who formerly opposed nuclear power but now support it. They say it's because our best bet for controlling climate change is nuclear power. Pandora's Promise opens today at the landmark Ken Cinema in Kensington. The self-proclaimed nuns on the bus arrived at the San Diego-Mexico border today with a message on immigration reform. The nuns are a group of Catholic sisters from various orders who focus on issues of social justice. They met with other immigration activists at Friendship Park as part of their 6,500-mile tour to urge lawmakers across the country to support immigration reform. We were on the border in Laredo and El Paso, Nogales, and now here in San Ysidro and Tijuana to acknowledge that this border is uh, better if it's, if it's constructed not with fences, but with good law. And so Nuns on the Bus has been on the road caring passionately for comprehensive immigration reform now. So we are looking for finding a home and proper path, earned path to the little to citizenship for those who are here, as well as a future flow, a reasonable path, access to come over and join their families. We're looking for earned path to citizenship, reunification of families. Well, the one thing that wasn't on the path to San Diego with the nuns was their bus because it broke down. The nuns had to hitch rides to get to the park. Meanwhile, the U.S. Senate continues to debate the immigration reform bill. Some 5,000 children whose parents have been deported end up in foster care in the U.S. Deported parents often face daunting barriers to reuniting with their children in their home country. KPBS Fronteras reporter Jill Repligal met with a few families trying to get their children back and explains how the immigration reform bill may be able to help. Now, Jill, this is a heart-wrenching problem. Essentially, these children are left behind in the U.S. when their parents are deported. How does that happen? So it's important to mention that this is not all children of deported parents, but Child Welfare Services might already be involved in a case where a parent gets deported if there were previous allegations of abuse or neglect. They might get involved simply because the parent is deported. Um, perhaps that parent doesn't have anywhere to leave the children, in which case they also might get involved. And, and parents sometimes get thrown in jail, and then they get deported, and that's another situation where they might get involved, uh, again, because there's some sort of allegation of abuse or neglect because the parents simply aren't present. And, and, and parents can bring their children with them if they are deported. As long as Child Welfare Services is not involved and there's not some situation where the kid is a ward of the state, yes. yes okay, there. well, let's talk about a couple of the families that you talked with. Uh, Tanya Velasquez was one mother, young mother that you talked with. Tell us about her. She lived in Anaheim for about eight years. She was stopped by police with her husband, and the police found drugs on him, not on her. Uh, she says she's never used drugs, was not involved, but she was pressured by her lawyer, not pressured, but she, her lawyer suggested that she plead guilty to a misdemeanor because she thought she was going to get out and be able to be with her daughter. And we that saw that picture, that her three-year-old daughter, right? Little. Three-year-old daughter, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, she did not get out of jail. She was then put into deportation proceedings. She was in detention for about six months, and she was deported to Tijuana last month in May. And so now what's the situation as far as with her and her daughter? Where's her daughter? So her daughter, she left her daughter with a friend, and her daughter has been with that friend the entire time. And now she's working. Child Welfare Services got involved, and uh, she now has to prove her case to a judge and to the social worker that's on her case that she's a fit parent. Do parents like Tanya in this deportation cases, is there a risk that they can actually lose custody of their children? Yeah, definitely. If they can't prove that they're fit to be to have their child back, then yes. And they have to do a number of things. To, um, each case plan is different, but the one that's the the standards are they have to have a house, they have to have a job, which can be very difficult for parents who are recently deported. Many of them show up in Tijuana with nothing, absolutely nothing. Uh, they often have to do therapies of different kinds. They have to do drug testing. And as you mentioned, they have to pay for all of this, you know, all the therapies and all the drug testing, and, and it can be a real burden on a lot of families. You also met with another couple who had lived in the U.S. for more than two decades before being deported. Um, tell us about them and what they're trying to do to get their children back. 
So this is a couple that lived in Mission Viejo, a very long-term residence. He was here for more than 20 years. She was here for about 13 years. And they were deported after they stole toys from a store. Again, you know, people tend to get involved with child welfare services because there, there is a legitimate problem. Um, they were deported to Tijuana. They've been trying to get their kids back for a year and a half, which is a really long time in child dependency cases. Uh, they say that the social worker has just given them more and more tasks. They think they've they meet the task. They both have jobs. They both they have a home. They've done everything, mm -hmm. and um, and they're sort of at a loss as to why this isn't moving forward. And they suspect that there's somewhat of a, a bias there against placing the kids in Mexico. That maybe you know the woman is concerned about. I don't know if it's a woman. Excuse me, but the 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 caseworker is concerned that they're not doing things the right way. Maybe they're cutting quarters. Maybe they've you know. Or just to afraid of, of the violence or whatever is happening in Mexico in general, not necessarily with that family. Well, I think they're, they, she's doubted that the family has done things the correct way. Okay. What do uh, the American side say about this? What is, what's happening with American social workers? What do they say? Like, we're doing our job. This is exactly the right thing to do. Or are they a little bit frustrated as well? Well, I talked to a woman from Orange County who is actually sort of the official liaison between uh, the Orange County Social Services Agency and the Mexican authorities. And, and her job is to sort of smooth out these cases because they can get very complicated with language barriers and there's uh, two different child welfare services involved, the Mexican side and the American side. And she says, you know, we have to be extremely careful in these cases. Um, one, because we are concerned about Mexico itself and the violence and, and uh, poverty. And these are things that are not supposed to be taken into account in a child welfare case, but that's what she said. And then the other thing is just that once the child is placed in Mexico, they can't follow up. It's out of their jurisdiction. So they feel a responsibility to that child to make sure because that they're they will have in, no control exactly, once that, that happens. they're in the best situation possible. Let's talk about the uh, current uh, Senate uh, immigration reform bill. Does, what parts of that will address, if any, uh, this issue? There are a couple things. Um, there's a, a part of the bill, and it's sort of a very subtle language, but it would lower the bar a little bit to allow immigration judges and agents more discretion to allow U.S. Uh, I'm sorry, parents of U.S. children to, to stay here. Again, that's up to their discretion, but it would give them a little more leeway to waive deportation for some of these parents. The other thing is that when parents are deported um, and the ones that have been deported thus far, the bill would give them an opportunity to apply to come back as legal residents. Okay. Front Terrace reporter Jill Replegal, thank you for bringing us this story. Now, you can see all of Jill's reporting on the issues of deported parents on our website, kpbs.org. The people for the ethical treatment of animals protested today in front of SeaWorld San Diego. The group says the theme park continues to allow close contact between trainers and orcas despite a trainer's death in 2010. Earlier this week, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA, fined SeaWorld Orlando for a similar safety violation. Trainers are in danger, but it's the whales from their confinement. They need to be released to a sanctuary along the ocean so they can live their lives out and not become violent. SeaWorld says the safety of guests, employees, and the welfare of animals are its highest priorities, adding the park has implemented significant changes to training protocols for its killer whale program they say are proven and safe to be effective. Uh, Anthem Blue Cross may be excluded from California's health exchange for small businesses. The state insurance commissioner wants to bar the industry giant because he says the company imposes excessive rate hikes. The state agency called Covered, Covered California is in charge of implementing the new federal health car, healthcare law and says it will consider the commissioner's request. Covered California is set to announce the state's health insurers and their proposed rates for small businesses exchange in August. Now, construction could start on California's high-speed rail this summer. The agency overseeing the $68 billion project won approval from a federal board to uh, federal board to break ground on the first track of the train, which runs from Merced to Fresno. But there's a catch. The rail authority must follow through on promises to mitigate environmental impact. 
Thursday's decision eliminated a key hurdle to start construction on what would be the nation's first bullet train. There won't just be books under the dome in the new Central Library in downtown San Diego. There will also be art. The first of four large art pieces has just been installed. KPBS cultural reporter Angela Carone says the new artwork is on a 60-foot wall in the library's auditorium. Donald Lipsky's artwork is made up of books, 1,500 books. I've always had a tremendous affection for books. Uh, people in my generation um, just do, I believe. Uh, maybe humans do. Lipsky recently spent a week in San Diego installing the artwork in the library's auditorium. The books were chosen for what they look like rather than for, uh, for their content. It's, it's not the world's great books, uh, important scientific theories. They're just books that uh, that I thought would look right in the piece. Lipsky and a crew layered the books one on top of another at different angles. Then they screwed them to the wall. It looks as if the wall were a giant magnet and sucked all the books in the room to its surface. There are close to 4,000 screws securing the books and the wire mesh cover on top. You can find Lipsky's large-scale public art pieces all over the country. He suspended this butterfly sculpture from the ceiling of a science building in Denver. Its wings are made from thousands of test tubes. This piece was made for the airport in Atlanta. It's made of Swarovski crystals. Lipsky seems to enjoy clever titles for his artwork. This one is called Rebel Lace. It's an anagram of Liberace. The artwork for the new Central Library is called Hiding My Candy. It's the title of one of the books on the wall, a memoir by a Southern drag queen named Lady Chablis, who was featured in the book and movie Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. So, do you think I'm beautiful? The phrase, hiding my candy, it seems to uh, Im imply an awful lot. Uh, and especially when you look at it in the context of these books that are hiding each other, the screen is uh, hiding the books more, that it, it seemed evocative and I thought was a really good title. Four commissioned artworks will be placed in the new library. Lipsky's piece was chosen from a national competition that drew 350 applicants. Dana Springs is overseeing the selection and installation of the art. One thing to think about is that often when we select an artwork, we're selecting the artist, not necessarily the proposal. In this case, we selected both the artist and the proposal. His artwork does mirror his personality, that he creates artwork that is large of scale, that is witty, that is classically beautiful, that is fun and playful, and in a lot of ways he transmits that kind of energy through his person. Lipsky's piece was actually selected for the library back in 2002. Already 10 years ago you could see that the uh, that what a book is in society was changing, uh, what a library is was changing. Now a, a library is lots and lots of other things. Uh, hence you have this auditorium that's really a, a beautiful new civic gathering space. Who knows how we'll be reading 30 years from now, which means Lipsky's artwork will only get more interesting, which is exactly his goal. I like to try to make work that uh, can have a lot of impact all at once, but still have enough substance that if you see it over time, uh, it'll give you more and more to think about. It's a challenge. It's a challenge. But uh, to me, it's very satisfying making art that's really for everybody. Angela Carone, KPBS News. This coming weekend is Father's Day, so guy bands and manly foods take center stage in San Diego. Here with a preview of some fun weekend events is Seth Coombs, arts writer and nightlife editor for Zugget San Diego. Seth, welcome. Thank you for having me. Now, San Diego Oyster Fest, it's going to be at the Marina Embarcadero this Saturday on June 15th. 
Mm -hmm. There's going to be oysters. Plenty tell of oysters. Us, Plenty of what, oysters. Tell us what else is going to be there. <laughs> oh, they're going to have all kinds of stuff. They're going to have uh, bands galore. They're going to have um, oyster expos to learn how about the farming process. They're going to have um, shuck and suck competitions <laughs> where people are racing. That sounds and, manly. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I guess I, women can do it. I too. can do it, and it's it, it, amazingly dangerous as well because they have to shuck them real fast with the big knife, you know. So, who is there a band there in particular you're looking forward to seeing? Uh, well, Mayor Hawthorne's playing. He's kind of got like this cool retro mm -hmm. R&B thing. Mm -hmm. uh, if you know people like people out there like that kind of sound, he's great. Um, there's also a local band called Family Wagon that I really, mm. really like. They're much more rocking and long-haired guys mm -hmm. just thrashing about, so they're fun. Oh, all right. Yeah, so yeah. some, some check new them out. people to ch uh, check out. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're a dad that doesn't like seafood in particular, or mm -hmm. if you want seafood on Saturday and pork on Sunday, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> June 16th, uh, tell us about the Big Bite Bacon Fest at the San Diego County Fair. Bacon. The bacon, bacon, bacon. I mean, it's everything bacon. <laughs> it's, uh, I mean, what, what can you what say kind about of it? What foods do you do? With, there's like, going to be desserts. There's going to be bacon apps. Bacon desserts. That's, oh, yeah. Oh, big uh -huh. time. There's a, 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 a company called Nothing Bunt, Nothing Bunt Cakes. Mm -hmm. and right. They, Down in uh, yeah, Mission Valley. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And they're going to have, you know, bacon bunt cakes. So there's a woman who's opening up her own pie shop in Encinitas who's going to have bacon pies. But there's also, you know, uh, if you go to the San Diego Fair, you inevitably end up at Chicken Charlie's, which is this chicken joint. But they have, uh, the, he's going to have uh, fried uh, bacon wrapped pickles. Okay. Yeah. That's something you can't get anywhere else. Let me, <laughs> uh, but of course, it's not a party or celebration unless there's music. I want you to listen to this. Okay. Now, these guys have been around for 20 years. They're a San Diego band, right? Uh, Gray Boy All-Stars. So what are they doing this weekend? They will be playing two shows at the Casbah, the legendary Casbah. And um, I would highly recommend anybody who hasn't seen this band over the years. They don't play too often, so I would I would highly recommend their a great, great live act. Friday and Saturday night. Friday and Saturday night. It's the first time they've played the Casbah in 10 years. Yeah, they, and as I said, they've been around forever, but they, they I shouldn't say forever, for 20 years. But um, they just released a new album, Inland Emperor. This came out last year, I mm -hmm. believe. And, and what's that like? Is their music about the same? Has it changed? Yeah, I mean, they're all fantastic musicians. Uh, I would say the songs on this particular album are a little bit more concise and, and compact. I would, I would attribute that to the fact that they've just grown a lot over the years and that uh, they they have just a better sense of you know pop you know like mm -hmm. how to just get all that fun time grooving kind of sound into like a, a more just succinct package. Now because they've been around and you said this is they haven't toured here in San Diego in the last ten years. Yeah. Are they limiting their tours? Will this be one of the last times you can see them? They kind of just pop up randomly every now and again. They they they'll play a show every you know a, a secret show or even like an announced show and then they'll they'll go on tour and just won't won't hang out for like a good two years. So uh, people should definitely go and check them out because it might be like the last time in a while. All right, plenty of uh, people to go see and check out at, at all the various venues. Uh, it says Coombs, thanks so much for uh, talking with us and giving us this preview. I want to let folks know that they can get the ticket information and more on San Diego Weekend Preview events uh, or weekend events, including the Oyster Fest, Big Bike Bacon Fest at the San Diego Fair, and Gray Boy All Stars uh, by going to our website, kpbs.org. I'm Judy Woodruff on the next news hour. Shields and Brooks analyze the week's news. That's Friday on the PBS News Hour. A San Francisco company is taking paperless to the next level, converting all conventional mail and sending it to your smartphone or tablet. Matt Friedman of the Associated Press shows us how. It's been a long time since the U.S. mail was delivered by horse and buggy, but bringing letters and packages to every address in the country has been a mandate for the Postal Service for nearly two centuries. Fast forward to now. Letter carriers still sort the mail and bring it to you six days a week, but email and modern mobility have radically altered the landscape. It's not that people don't like mail. It's that they don't like the negative attributes of mail that don't line up with their lives. What if you never had to deal with physical mail again? That's the promise of a new company called Outbox. 
Right now, without changing your address, you can sign up for Outbox in about 30 seconds. And the next day, you're completely paperless. Outbox relies on what it calls unpostmen. Pay $5 a month and provide a key, and you'll never have to see the paper mail again. The company scans the mail so you can read it on your iPad or other digital device. All the junk mail that I received was right there, and I could hit the unsubscribe button, and it'll never get printed again. And I can put the rest of it into folders. The, uh, the stuff I do actually physically want, I can ask for, and they'll make sure that I get it in my, my mailbox. Outbox's new approach may work well for some customers, but the company has a long way to go to topple the postal service, which delivers to more than 150 million addresses. Matt Friedman, Associated Press. UC San Diego's graduation weekend starts tonight. The university will hand out more than 8,000 diplomas. Among this year's featured speakers, speakers actor UCSD uh, and UCSD grad Robert Buckley, also the Daily Show contributor and comedian Louis Black, and San Diego Councilwoman Sherry Leitner. And the weather will be cooperating during those graduation ceremonies. It's going to be cool along the coast with temperatures in the upper 60s. Inland will see warmer it will, tomorrow and about 75 degrees. And in the mountains, lots of sunshine. And in the desert, no, no exception here, hot and dry. You can find more on tonight's stories and download the KPBS app on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thank you for joining us. Have a great night and a happy Father's Day weekend. Thank you.